tonight, this entire show is basically going to be one long recap of one very long week. And, <laughs> and, and one event in particular, meaning that, sadly, there is going to be no time to talk about Trump insisting that the UN was laughing with him <laughs> and not at him, which it absolutely wasn't. <laughs> Nor is there going to be time to delve into what was clearly the most fun story of the week, this. Well, the Philadelphia Flyers have a new mascot, and fans are saying, what the... That's seven-foot-tall Gritty. Gritty unveiled today in front of a group of kids probably scarred for life. Yeah. Yeah, those kids should be scarred for life. Gritty is fucking horrific. <laughs> Every single photo of him is appalling. I mean, look at this one. That is a nightmare. How about this one? That is simply psychotic. Gritty looks like the end result of the orange McDonald's fry guy hooking up with Grimace. And we've been over this a million times before on this show. If you're a McDonald's mascot, you do not have sex with another McDonald's mascot. <laughs> Your genetics are too similar and the kids always turn out weird. <laughs> very, very weird. And incidentally, it's not like Gritty has any business being a hockey mascot. Apparently, he hasn't really figured out how to navigate on the ice yet. He fell multiple times uh, in his debut last night. Uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins tweeting, LOL, OK, to which Gritty responded, sleep with one eye open tonight, bird. Holy shit, Gritty, calm down. They're just engaging in some inter-team banter, and you've gone straight to, I will murder you in your sleep. <laughs> and look, there is absolutely nothing that I would love to do more tonight than, than talk about Gritty all night long. From, from the fact that he's already done a Kim Kardashian-style photo shoot, <laughs> to the fact that, and this is true, someone has already got an actual tattoo of him on their body. <laughs> Interestingly, that someone, Jimmy Carter. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, though, the fun we just had must now stop, because instead we need to talk about Brett Kavanaugh, Supreme Court nominee and walking crushed beer can. <laughs> now, on Thursday, Christine Blasey Ford, who has accused Kavanaugh of sexually assaulting her in 1982, came before the Senate Judiciary Committee to deliver some powerful testimony. I am here today not because I want to be. I am terrified. I am here because I believe it is my civic duty to tell you what happened to me while Brett Kavanaugh and I were in high school. Right, and she did just that, describing in de detail her recollection of how a drunk Kavanaugh uh, pinned her down, tried to remove her clothing, and put his hand over her mouth when she tried to scream. She insisted that this could not possibly be a case of mistaken identity because she was 100% certain that it was him. And after her opening statement, she then took questions, which sometimes took an odd turn. Like when the prosecutor, to whom the Republicans had outsourced their responsibilities, seized on a polygraph test that Ford had passed. Did you pay for the polygraph yourself? I don't... I don't... I don't think so. Okay. Do you know who did pay for the polygraph? Not yet, no. I believe you said it hasn't been paid for yet. Is that correct? Let me put an end to this mystery. Her lawyers have paid for her polygraph. As is routine. Wait! Whoa, 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 whoa! Whoa, 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 whoa! Slow your roll there! As is routine, don't you try and brush her question aside. She just cracked this case wide open. <laughs> she found the missing piece of the puzzle, specifically a puzzle that reads, Who fucking cares? <laughs> Ford's testimony was brave and compelling and seemed to affect many on the committee, including Republican Senator Orrin Hatch, who chose to express his admiration in a far from ideal way. Have you found Dr. Ford credible? Well, it's too early to say. I, 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 don't, think, I don't think she's uncredible. I think she's an attractive, uh, good witness, but uh, it's way early. What do you mean uh, by attractive, you... sir? Oh. In other words, she's pleasing. Oh! Pleasing. You should not use the word pleasing to describe a sexual assault survivor painfully recounting one of the worst moments of her life. You honestly shouldn't really use it to describe anything. Maybe, maybe watching milk mix into your coffee. Except, you know what, not even then, because the moment you say, watching this milk is pleasing, <laughs> you come off like a creep who's waiting for everyone to leave the room so he can <laughs> fuck his coffee. The point is... By lunchtime on Thursday, it honestly seemed that Kavanaugh's nomination could be finished. Even Fox News was implying as much. 
This was extremely emotional, extremely raw, and extremely credible. And uh, nobody could listen to her deliver those words and talk about the assault and the impact it had had on his life, on her life, and not have the her heart go, your heart go out to her. This is a disaster for the Republicans. That is. Fox News calling Ford's testimony a disaster for the Republicans. And not like one of those Puerto Rico disasters, you know, this time one they might actually care about. <laughs> but then, then came Kavanaugh's testimony. And it is worth looking at it in detail tonight, because in every regard, it could not have been more different from Ford's. Uh, for starters, while she was remarkably composed in discussing traumatic details, Kavanaugh came straight out of the gate weird in his opening statement, <laughs> not just denying all her allegations, but almost breaking down while attempting to paint a folksy image of his time in high school. I worked out with other guys at Toby's house. He was the great quarterback on our football team. And his dad ran workouts. Yeah, he's crying at the memory of lifting weights at his friend Tobin's house. I hate to say it, but I'm starting to think that men might be too emotional for the Supreme Court. <laughs> also, 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 he'd be, he'd be, he'd be really pretty if he just smiled more. And, <laughs> And, and it wasn't just memories of a high school quarterback that was making him tear up. I've always had a lot of close female friends. I remember talking almost every night, it seemed, to my friends Amy or Julie. <laughs> or Kristen, or Karen, or Suzanne, or Maura, or Megan, or Nikki. The list goes on. Okay. That's not testimony, though, is it? That is a plaintive spoken word cover of Mambo Number no. 5. <laughs> I remember my friends Angela, Pamela, Sandra, and Rita. <laughs> and as I continue, you know they're getting sweeter. <laughs> bois, 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 bois. But when Kavanaugh was not choking back tears, he was starting to get noticeably angry, arguing that he was the victim of a giant conspiracy. This allegation was unleashed and publicly deployed over Dr. Ford's wishes. And then, and then, as no doubt was expected, if not planned, came a long series of false last-minute smears designed to scare me and drive me out of the process before any hearing occurred. Crazy stuff. Gangs, illegitimate children, fights on boats in Rhode Island. I mean, come on! Do I seem like exactly the type of person who would get into a fight on a boat in Rhode Island? Seriously, you tell me. When you picture a fight on a boat in Rhode Island, do you just picture two of me yelling at each other at exactly this pitch and volume? Is that what you're saying? That if you wanted my haircut, you would tell your barber to give you the fight on a boat in Rhode Island? Well, I would like to see you say that to my face on a boat in Rhode Island, and that's all I have to shout about that. Fuck you! I'll see you on the water! And remember... Remember, what you've just seen was him reading from a prepared statement. <laughs> it got even stranger once he started taking questions. Did you consume alcohol during your high school years? Yes, we drank beer. Uh, my friends and I, the boys and girls. Yes, we drank beer. I liked beer. Still like beer. We drank beer. The drinking age, as I noted, was 18, so the seniors were legal. Senior year in high school, people were legal to drink. And we, yeah, we drank beer. And I said, sometimes, sometimes probably had too many beers, and sometimes other people had too many beers. What we drank you... beer. We liked beer. Yeah, I get that. I do. I, do. I, um, I get that loud and clear, Brett. But, but the question isn't really, do you like beer, is it? It's, how much do you like it? Just like how the question in Jeffrey Dahmer's trial wasn't, do you like people? It was, do you like people to a really problematic extent? <laughs> and when pressed on his drinking, Kavanaugh became either dismissive or outright hostile. And it was at those moments 
you got a real sense of who this man actually is. What do you consider to be too many beers? I don't know. Uh, you know, we, whatever the chart says. I like beer. I don't know if you do. Okay. Do you like beer, Senator, or not? Um, what do you like to drink? Next one is... Senator, what do you like judge. to drink? So right. You're saying there's never been a case where you drank so much that you didn't remember what happened the night before or part of what happened. That's, you're asking about, yeah, blackout. I don't know. Have you? Could you answer the question, Judge? I just... So you have, that's not happened. Is that your answer? Yeah, and I'm curious if you have. OK, so first, aside from being deeply disrespectful, have you is just not the answer of an innocent person. If you ask someone if they ever blew a dog and they go, I don't know, have you? <laughs> that person blew a dog. He blew a fucking dog, and in all likelihood, not just one, either. <laughs> and that, that surly tone was emblematic of Kavanaugh's demeanour throughout the hearing. Not the tone of a man who hopes to one day have the honour of serving on the Supreme Court, but the tone of someone who feels entitled to be on it and, frankly, can't believe that you're being such a dick about this. <laughs> and that actually does make some sense, because this is a man who has had every imaginable advantage. His elite high school, and this is true, has its own nine-hole golf course. <laughs> now, am I saying that someone who went to a school with its own golf course should not be on the Supreme Court? Yeah, yeah, I think I am. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, I, did, I didn't plan to when I started that sentence, but here we are, and I'm going to stand by it. But, but Kavanaugh didn't just rely on belligerence to refute Ford's charges. He brought evidence, specifically a calendar from 1982, about which he was, and I know this will shock you, weirdly emotional. Why did I keep calendars? My dad started keeping de detailed calendars of his life in 1978. He did so as both a calendar and a diary. Christmas time, we sit around and he regales us with old stories. Old milestones, old weddings, old events from his calendars. Now, look, I, I know that it may seem cruel to make fun of a man crying over his late father's calendars, but what if I were to tell you that his father is still alive and was sitting right behind him? That's him there! And that is why I am now completely comfortable saying that every Christmas we'd gather round and Dad would regale us with old events from his calendar is the single weirdest fucking thing <laughs> I've ever heard anybody say. And to make, it, to make it weirder, remember, Kavanaugh just said that his dad started keeping calendars in 1978, when Kavanaugh was 13, meaning he would have been 14 at the time his dad had even a single calendar to read to his children from. <laughs> and an adult man reading last year's calendar to his 14-year-old son <laughs> is literally the saddest Christmas I can imagine, <laughs> other than being one of the innocent people who gets murdered in the movie Die Hard. <laughs> that is literally the only other example. And, and the truth is, Kavanaugh's calendar may not have actually helped him, because while he told the panel he never attended a gathering like the one Dr Ford describes in her allegation, in fact, his calendar shows at least one similar event, with at least two of the people Ford named in her letter. And Kavanaugh misrepresenting the truth actually became something of a really troubling pattern. For instance, he repeatedly made this strong claim to poke holes in Ford's story. I just want to re-emphasize, all four witnesses who are allegedly at the event have said it didn't happen, including Dr. Ford's longtime friend, Ms. Kaiser. Except this 53-year-old frat pledge is actually significantly misstating the facts there, because in reality, three of those people merely said that they didn't recall the party as described, and Ford's friend, Ms. Kaiser, did specifically say she believes Ford's allegation. And the fourth person there is Kavanaugh himself. So Kavanaugh just wildly mischaracterized evidence, and that is one thing a judge really should know not to do. It's basically that and don't tuck your robes into your blue jeans <laughs> because it's objectively a bad look. Then, then there was the fact that for all of Kavanaugh's talk of his wholesome teenage years spent respecting women for their friendships and doing sick reps in Tobin's dad's house, 
His high school yearbook tells a very different story. For instance, he and his bro friends brag about being Renata alumni, referring to a girl that they knew. Now, Kavanaugh claims that that was completely asexual and just clumsily intended to show affection and that she was one of us, which is a little hard to believe, given that, A, Renata only just found out about it and said the insinuation is horrible, hurtful and simply untrue, and, B, if it was just affection for a friend, where's the alumni society for Amy? Or Julie? <laughs> or Kristen? Or Karen? Or Maura? Especially Maura! Maura, most of all! Now, Kavanaugh had similarly implausible explanations for other terms in the yearbook, specifically those commonly associated with drinking or sex. Have you... I don't know if it's buffed or boofed. How do you pronounce that? Judge? That refers to flatulence. We were 16. Let's look at uh, Beach Week Ralph Club biggest contributor. What does the word Ralph mean in that? Uh, that probably refers to uh, throwing up. I'm known to have a weak stomach and I always have. Devil's Triangle. Drinking game. Bullshit! <laughs> The term Devil's Triangle is commonly known to refer to a threesome involving two men and one woman, so I'm just not buying that unless all your drinking games were named after widely recognised sex acts. Oh, doggy style? Drinking game. Uh, <laughs> uh, you pour vodka in a bowl and you lap it up while wearing only a dog collar. A uh, fisting? Drinking game. That's gripping a Shiraz in each fist and toasting the progress of feminism. <laughs> 69ing? Absolutely drinking game. That's listening to Brian Adams' hit song, Summer of 69, while uneventfully drinking a beer on the porch. <laughs> Even C-SPAN callers were not buying this whole drinking game defence. Go ahead, Carl. Hi, I just wanted to echo uh, a few things that another caller said, uh, which is that a devil's triangle is certainly not a drinking game. It's an encounter with two men and a woman. Blasey. We'll go next to Mary in Bronxville, New York. I like to imagine that that guy calls in every day to describe what a devil's triangle is, and that was the only day he stood even a chance of getting all the way through his explanation. <laughs> and look, while it may seem unbelievably petty to give this much attention to a high schooler's yearbook, you have to remember that, to some extent, many were watching this hearing to try and ascertain who was more trustworthy. Was it the terrified psychology professor who blew up her entire life to relive her trauma on a national stage? Or was it Judge Animal House, who seemed to be sweatily making up drinking games before members of the Senate? <laughs> and yet, for some senators, Kavanaugh's poor performance was completely immaterial, as they had already made up their mind. Orrin Hatch, taking a break from being pleased... <laughs> made the broad case that it was ridiculous to even ask questions about an event that took place such a long time ago. This is a national disgrace, the way you're being treated. There's been no whisper of misconduct by him in the time he's been a judge. What we have are uncorroborated, unsubstantiated claims from his teenage years. Now, that is clearly a shitty, disingenuous argument, though, although I will give Hatch credit for invoking the phrase teenage years with the voice of a 13-year-old whose balls <laughs> are literally dropping mid-sentence. <laughs> now, as for Lindsey Graham, he turned his performative disgust at the process up to 10. This is the most unethical sham since I've been in politics. And if you really wanted to know the truth, you sure as hell wouldn't have done what you've done to this guy. You're looking for a fair process? You came to the wrong town at the wrong time, my friend. OK, first of all, Lindsey Graham sounds like the least intimidating sheriff in the entire Wild West. <laughs> you turn back around and get back on your horse, Mr. Man, cos what you're looking at is the soft, tender little baby face of justice. You came to the wrong town at the wrong time, my friend. The wrong time. Pew, pew, pew! Baby face. Justice. Get on your horse! Rad! <laughs> but, but look, second, Lindsey Graham is not actually wrong there. He looks like a doll that's not allowed to be within 50 feet of a playground, <laughs> but he is not technically wrong. This process was deeply flawed, but 
That is because he and the Republican majority designed it that way. If they wanted to avoid a he said, she said situation, they absolutely could have. But instead, they only called two people, so we only heard what he said and what she said. <laughs> a much fairer process would have involved gathering evidence and hearing from others, uh, like Kavanaugh's classmates, in particular his high school friend Mark Judge, who Ford says was in the room during the alleged assault. But that is not how Republicans chose to set up the hearing. And for all Kavanaugh's emotional appeals about wanting his name cleared, he was repeatedly asked about whether he supported an FBI investigation, and he consistently dodged the question. Judge Kavanaugh, will you support an FBI investigation do, right now? I, I will do whatever the committee wants to... Personally, do you think that's the best thing for us to do? <laughs> you want to answer? You know, look, Senator, I, I've... I've I, I've said I wanted a hearing and I'd said I was welcome anything. You're welcome anything. Just say you will support an investigation. You've been accused of a heinous crime that you insist you did not commit. If I were Kavanaugh, I would be desperately trying to prove my innocence in every possible way. FBI investigations, polygraph tests, sworn affidavits from not only Mark Judge, but also all my other boys from G-Town Prep. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about Tobin, Timmy, Squee, PJ, Cumrug, Tooks, Merck, C-Dubs, Dirty Pete, Fat Andy, <laughs> Spliff Dog, The Horn Dog, Bonowitz, Bonowitz's older brother, J Money, and Shit Dick. You know, you know, character witnesses. And, and look, at this point, let's actually pull back and look at the picture of Kavanaugh's character that we now have. Because even if you don't think he's guilty of sexual assault, or even if you think that it's impossible to say whether he is because it happened in his teenage years, <laughs> even then, there should be plenty in what we saw this week to cause you real concern. Because a key part of the job that he is up for is judgment and temperament. And this week, we saw Kavanaugh talk over the top of senators, dodge questions, and conflate doesn't recall something happening with deny something happened, which is, again, a fucking important distinction for a judge. Not to mention, he repeatedly wept at the concept of calendars. <laughs> and, and there was one more important moment that I would argue is disqualifying in and of itself, because ideally, a Supreme Court justice should make decisions independent of politics. Kavanaugh himself has stated the court must never be viewed as a partisan institution. And he is right about that. And yet, in his opening statement, a document he had time to draft and consider, his tone was positively Trumpian. This whole two-week effort has been a calculated and orchestrated political hit, fueled with apparent pent-up anger about President Trump and the 2016 election, fear that has been unfairly stoked about my judicial record, revenge on behalf of the Clintons, and millions of dollars in money from outside left-wing opposition groups. Now, that is absolutely horrifying. And, and it is worth taking a moment now to note the norm that has just been shattered. Because I know that we're all basically callous to people talking that way now, but we are supposed to have at least nine people left in America who do not talk that way. And yet Kavanaugh just all but came out and said that he's going to approach his entire tenure as one giant case of me versus the fucking libtard cucks. <laughs> and this, this brings me to the most basic question that remains. Why? Why this particular asshole? Why is he the hill the Conservatives are willing to die on? And I do know that for some of Kavanaugh's most ardent supporters, this is a purely ideological issue. Senators may not say it out loud, but this woman for Kavanaugh did. I hope Bingay gets in personally, um, because I want abortion to stop. Even if it turns out he's guilty, I think I'm still going to support him, and I hope he gets in, because this could be a good chance to overturn abortion. OK, so it's fine. It's fine to appoint someone who has committed sexual assault to the Supreme Court, as long as they will curtail abortion rights. It's a stance that prioritises human lives. As long as you think life begins at conception, stops right before a sexual assault, and then starts right back up again as soon as that assault is over. Now, obviously, obviously, I personally do not agree with that. But even if ending legal abortion is your ultimate goal, there are many Conservative judges who could deliver that to you without all of Kavanaugh's issues. Because purely as a judge, there is nothing unique about Kavanaugh. 
Nothing. He's not uniquely qualified. Trump reportedly picked him from a list of 25 names provided by outside groups like the Federalist Society, whose executive vice president explicitly pointed out he had no preference regarding the list. Is there a leading contender for you? No, there's not. Really not? No, it's, the list is really good. They're not in order? You're just saying... No, anyone? no, no. You can throw a dart at that list and, <laughs> in my view, you'd be fine. Wow! He answered that question about Supreme Court justices like he was just asked which pickle in a jar <laughs> is his favourite pickle. I, I don't know, man, they're all pickles. It's a pickle jar. So if it's in this jar, it's a fucking pickle. <laughs> but... For some reason, the Republican leadership is continuing to push Kavanaugh hard. In fact, on Friday, Lindsey Graham seemed to view Kavanaugh with even more relish. I've never felt better about him being on the bench than I do right now. Senator. Senator. Really? You feel better now than before Kavanaugh testified? Do you really mean that? Or are you afraid that if you don't say it, Kavanaugh will challenge you to a fight on a boat in Rhode Island? <laughs> because I do get that. He seems like the type. <laughs> the point is, after all of this, I genuinely cannot see a single good reason for pushing Kavanaugh over a replacement candidate. Because you know, deep down, any judge they choose is almost certainly going to restrict abortion rights. You don't need to choose an unhinged partisan with multiple accusations of sexual misconduct hanging over him. So it feels like they're doing this just to deliver a fuck you to Democrats, and even more directly, a fuck you to women. Because when this, when this week began, the biggest fear for many was that the committee would not believe Christine Blasey Ford. But by the time the week ended, it seemed that something darker might have happened. Because it seemed their response was, oh, we believe you, we just don't care. And the tragic thing is, she knew this was a possibility. She said so explicitly during her testimony. Once he was selected and it seemed like he was popular and that the, it was an, a sure vote, I was calculating daily the, the risk benefit for me of coming forward and wondering whether I would just be jumping in front of a train that was headed to where it was headed anyway and that I would just be personally annihilated. She knew publicly reliving the most traumatic event of her life could have absolutely no effect on anything, and yet she spoke up anyway. It is absolutely incredible the lengths that some people will go to for a free polygraph test. And look, <laughs> look, look, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I am, I am not saying that this is a done deal just yet. They were desperately pushing Kavanaugh through on Friday, only for extraordinary pressure to force the reopening of the FBI investigation, which, by the way, may well end up being so limited as to be essentially pointless. But the fact is, only continued pressure has even the slightest chance of stopping Kavanaugh's confirmation. And if he does, as seems increasingly likely, make his way to the court, we should never forget how that happened or what he represents. We certainly will not forget it on this show. You may know that for years, we've had an all-dog Supreme Court with dogs... <laughs> playing the justices, from uh, Samuel Alito to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> right, good dog, good dog. <laughs> Don't die. Uh, good dog, but good dog. <laughs> sit, sit, and don't die. Now, 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 since 2017, it's actually been a mostly dog Supreme Court because Neil Gorsuch is represented on it by a lobster. Uh, that's because <laughs> his seat was stolen from Merrick Garland, therefore, like a lobster, he does not belong there. But Kavanaugh... <laughs> Kavanaugh, if he is seated, doesn't even deserve that treatment. He deserves something that constantly reminds people who he is. Something hostile, consistently unsettling, temperamentally unpleasant, and that screams, who the fuck allowed this to happen? So I pray that we will not have to use this. But if we do, I see no more fitting embodiment of Kavanaugh than this. <laughs> yes, that's right. Just as the actual Supreme Court should not have to deal with Kavanaugh, our animal Supreme Court should not have to deal with this mutated carpet swatch that appears to be tweaking on bath socks. I truly hope it does not come to this. And look, there is still a chance that we can stop it, so please call your senators tomorrow and tell them you do not want to be looking at this for the next 30 years. Get off the bench! You're not even confirmed yet. 
No, I don't want a beer! I don't want a beer, you big weirdo! Get off that bench, you entitled monster!